Thank you for joining in the singing. And if you turn your Bibles this evening to Nehemiah chapter 4, we're going to look at a few verses in Nehemiah chapter 4 and one verse in Nehemiah chapter 6. And this is the eighth message from Nehemiah on essentials to leadership that we're looking at, trying to be uh, the Christian testimony that God would have us to be and have things in our life uh, that are essential. Uh, to be in just what the Lord would have us to be. And I pray that God will help us all and we can learn these things in Nehemiah. This evening we're going to look at two elements, that of persistence and the other is finishing. In Nehemiah chapter 4, we'll look uh, at the first one in verses 6 through 9. The Bible said, So built we the wall, and all the wall was joined together unto the half thereof. For the people had a mind to work. But it came to pass that when Samballad and Tobiah and the Arabians and the Ammonites and the Ashdodites heard that the walls of Jerusalem were made up and that the breaches began to be stopped, then they were very wroth and conspired all of them together to come and to fight against Jerusalem and to hinder it. Nevertheless, we made our prayer unto God and set a watch against them day and night because of them. We'll look at two essentials tonight, and the first one that we're looking at here is that of persistence. And I want to say several things about being persistent as a Christian. And we find it here, the first characteristic of that is we see in these people, they had a mind to work. The people had a mind to work. They had made up their mind that they were going to do 
the work that God had set for them to do. They were determined to carry out their responsibility. You know, we live in a society today, especially among young people, uh, they want benefits with no responsibility. A majority, I was reading uh, an article yesterday and another one today that talked about the younger people in our society that want the government to give them more, to do more for them, to help them more. And most of us that are older know that's exactly the opposite of what needs to be done uh, because when you, when you get more from the government, they get more of you. It comes that way. It comes with control. And the same thing with the world. The more you get from the world, the more control the world has over you. But a lot of people want benefits without any responsibility. Uh, I never did. Uh, I, I was very loyal when I worked somewhere. And I worked, my first several jobs were minimum wage when it's $2 an hour, right at $2 an hour. And, and I just, I thought, I never did really, a lot of times think about asking the boss for a raise, but I asked for more hours. I wanted more hours where I could make more money. And, and thank God I had one boss man that worked for one of the best jobs I ever had. He would give me all the overtime I wanted. If I wanted 30 hours or 40 hours, we had a Mexican. His name was Jesus. We called him Jesse because we told him uh, we didn't like to call him Jesus because you spell it the same way you spell Jesus. And we said, we don't think you're up to that. So we called him Jesse. And uh, I remember one time we were down in Hilton Head Island. I was doing a sale at a store there on Hilton Head Island. And Jesse was working for the boss man at his house there at Hilton Head Island. And I went over to check on Jesse to see how he was coming along. And, and he told me, he said, you know, uh, he said, Mr. McAbee tells me, Jesse, people like you only come along every hundred years. And I said, do you know what he means by that, Jesse? He said, what does he mean? I said, not many people are willing to work a hundred hours a week. And he would work. He would work a hundred hours in a week. If he was allowed to, he would work a hundred hours in a week and send, his, send money back to his family in Mexico, I commend him for that. There wasn't anything lazy about it. I, I never did hit 100 hours. I hit 70, 75, but never did 100. But he had a mind to work. He was determined to work. And if we as the children of God and we as members of Waterloo Baptist Church, if we want God to do something great here at this church, if we want God to bless this church, we have to have a mind to work. Not be observers, but be participants and we need people like Nehemiah had that had a mind to continue. They were persistent. The second thing I would say about that is don't make plans for failure. A lot of people start out and they'll have a plan to say now if this don't work what are we going to do? They haven't even got started yet but they're making a plan for if what they do fails. We ought not to ever start out like that. We ought to start out with a plan for succeeding, not a plan for failure, but they completed their work by sheer determination. You know, I go to the mission field when the Lord allows us to go, and it's essential that we go. And I, sometimes I take people that have never been to the mission field, and we go, and sometimes, especially when we go into areas where we have a number of preachers that we can bring together, we always try to bring those preachers together. We always try to have a meal and a time of fellowship, and it's a good time for those pastors because most of them don't ever get that opportunity to go out and eat somewhere. But we bring them together, and we just have a big time together. And they, they're hardworking, have a lot on them, and uh, most of them have a lot of needs in their life. But we bring them together, and when they're having that time of fellowship, they're laughing, enjoying the time, and uh, they just seem like they're not worried about anything. And I have people with me that say, boy, this is not, I really love it here. I love it. But they fail to see when the crowd is gone and that missionary is on the dirt road walking 10 or 15 or 20 miles to get to another mission that he's working in. They don't see that part of it. It's not glamorous then. It looks glamorous when everybody's together having a good time, but we don't see often, a lot of people don't see because they don't have time to go everywhere, and they think, boy, I'd like to do this, but they don't see the work. They see 
the glamour. And uh, those missionaries that we go to visit when we leave them, they go back to the hard part. They go back to the day-to-day -day just like we do here. And a lot of people don't see that. And you got to have a mind to continue on. you got to have a, a mindset that you're not going to fail. Brother Arnold, uh, one of our missionaries, and I really need to be careful about mentioning where they are in case uh, we could get checked, I guess. We could, we could really get checked on Facebook. And I thought about this today when going to that particular country where he's at. They're, they're under oppression really bad right now. I talked to Brother Arnold the other day, and uh, the police are really on them. Uh, they're under the heavy hand of the government. They're really cracking down heavy. He told me how bad it was getting there. And he said, we're planning for you to be here in March to help with the celebration of our new plant here. And uh, they're having to move. They're having to relocate, and they have to do that uh, so often because of the law. And he's telling me about all of that and uh, then invite me to come. And I got to think about that today. You know, I put stuff on Facebook and stuff about the work there, and I think, you know, when I have to send to Washington to get a visa to go there, and they could look my name up on Facebook and see everything that we do, and I really don't want to go to jail there, but I, on the other hand, I don't really worry about that. Uh, I just think the Lord take care of us. We do want to be careful. But what I'm saying is this is a man, and we have men in that country that have a determination to succeed. They're not quitters. They're continuing on in the work, even after many of them have been arrested and put in jail for preaching the gospel. They, I, I remember the year I was there and flew in from Myanmar, had flown back in to, to that, that particular country, and they said the police raided us Sunday and said they'll be back this Sunday, and that's when I was supposed to preach. And I asked them about counseling the service. I said, do we need to cancel the service? Now, I'll never forget, I believe it was Brother Melvin, one of our missionaries there, that just had 17 or 14 or 17 young people saved last week. Uh, he said, Pastor, if we bow to the law, we'll never get anything done for God in this country. They are there to succeed, and I admire those men greatly. That's why we try to encourage them from our end. They are determined. They have a determination that the average person wouldn't have. And we need to have that in our own life. If we're going to do anything for God, we need to have determination to succeed. Don't make failure an option. And then working was the focus. The Bible said they had a mind to work. I mean, they, they fixed their mind on working. They were diligent about it. They were faithful to do it. They showed up every day and they stayed as long as they needed to stay and worked as long as they needed to work. Thank God for people like that. And we need those people in the church. It takes those that are determined to get the work done, but working was their focus. And we'll not ever succeed. We'll not ever accomplish great things until that's the focus. And I pray to God that all of us will have that in our mind and have that determination to work. Then let me say praying is essential. He tells us here in this passage, they continued in prayer. You know why they do that? Same reason we need to, because that's our means of communication with God is to pray. I find calls to pray all during the day. And I ain't saying it sounds spiritual, but I pray more than I've ever prayed. But let me say, in light of that statement, I have more to pray about than I've ever had to pray. And I pray constantly throughout the day because I need to pray. And I need God to help me keep going on. The devil, he'll do everything he can to try to stop you, slow you down, make you give up. He'll do everything he can. He'll throw all that he can at us. But if we keep talking to God, we're going to find there's an encourager on the other end of that prayer. And that's our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. But our communication with God is essential if we're going to accomplish anything. Prayer makes a difference. You've heard that song, Air You Left Your Room This Morning. Did you think to pray? There's a phrase in that song that says, Oh, how praying rests the weary. 
Prayer will change the night today. So when life seems dark and dreary, don't forget to pray. Prayer makes a difference, folks. I'm telling you, prayer gets me through every day. It's praying. I know that it's necessary for me. I couldn't make it through the day without praying. And so praying is essential. Then the Bible said they kept a watch. God help us to keep a watch. You know, I'm afraid parents aren't watching their children like they ought to. I'm afraid they're not. And I'm afraid a lot of children, some of them be right here from Waterloo Baptist Church, are going to get swallowed up by the world. They're going to get messed up by the world because people don't take it serious about watching their children. Boy, I pray, I pray for my, I still pray for my children, my sons and law. I pray for my grandchildren especially every day, many times a day, not just once or twice, many times a day I pray for them and ask God to protect them, to keep a hedge about them to help us be a godly influence, to help their mom and dad be a godly influence in their life. But I'm afraid even from Waterloo Baptist Church and every church around this country and around the world as far as that goes, somehow parents fall into this false sense of security that their children are going to be all right. But I want to tell you something. The devil's got traps that you can't even imagine. He can trap your children in or trap your grandchildren in. I'm afraid a lot of parents don't take it seriously. I see it. I know they don't. It ain't, I, it ain't that I'm thinking. I know they don't. I'm telling you this not because I love you and care about you. I care about our children and our church, and I pray for them that God will help them to have godly influences in their life. But God help us to keep a watch. We need to keep a watch over, our, first of all, our own life, then our families. And our church, we need to keep a watch because the devil, the Bible said, is as a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. We need to keep a watch. The enemy's always around us. And can I say this? You and I watch out for what matters to us. We watch out for what matters. Now, I, I see children sometimes, I wonder what in the world is a mom and daddy thinking. God help us. And sometimes I think the mom and daddy ain't thinking. I'm not being mean. I'm just saying to try to help you, folks. I'm telling you, the devil has traps out there. And nobody's family in here is immune from the traps of the devil. And a lot of people could testify to that tonight. But they kept a watch. If we're going to do anything for God, we've got to keep a watch. Then the second thing here is finishing. If you'll just flip over a page to Nehemiah chapter 6 and verse number 15. The Bible says, So the wall was finished in the 20th and 5th day of the month Ehu, which is the month of September, Elu, in 50 and 2 days. I want to say a number of things about finishing. First of all, it is an imperative. It's imperative. Starting is the easy part. Starting's the easy part. Finishing. Is what's difficult. It's easy to get people to start, but it ain't so easy to finish. If you run in a race and others are in front of you, a lot of people just drop out. And that's the way a lot of people are in the Christian life. They see others that God's blessing and God's doing a work in their hearts and lives and ain't working for them like that. They just drop out to say, ain't no need for me to try. And the reason maybe God's blessing some of those others is because they're persistent and have been persistent and have kept going on. The importance is finishing. You get to the halfway point, and that's a critical point because you get to that halfway point, and here's what happens to a lot of people. They get halfway, and instead of seeing how much progress they've made, they get their eyes fixed on what is yet to be done. They don't think of being halfway there. They think, man, I've been doing all this and I got this much more to do. And so they don't finish. A lot of times I go and speak in some places, maybe where people have messed their lives up and I'm trying to be an encouragement to them. And I give them the illustration of a quarterback on the football field. If, if he's at midfield on the 50-yard line with this team and he gets sacked back to the 40-yard line, 
And then he gets sacked back to the 30-yard line. He gets to looking and thinking how much farther he has to go just to get back to where he started. And that's what the devil wants you to think. He wants to think, man, you're going to have to go this far just to get back to where you were. And a lot of people throw their hands up, say, it just ain't worth it. I can't do it. Well, you can if you have Christ in you. Paul said that we can through him, we can do all things through Christ which strengthens me. We can do it. We're able to do it if we're saved, if we're the children of God, but it's an imperative to finish. It's no good. Everything is in vain if you quit. I've been on the mission field and seen where people started building a building, building a house or building something, and the weeds have grown up taller than the building. They just quit. I've seen it in country after country where somebody started something and maybe they didn't have the resources to finish it, but they quit for one reason or another. So that means everything they did was in vain. They may as well not have done it at all if we're not going to finish. There's no need to start if we're not going to finish. And so it's critical that we finish. Let me give you some illustrations. God finished the creation. Genesis chapter 2 and verse 1. Thus the heavens and the earth were finished. God did his work till it's finished. He tells us that in the Bible. Moses finished in Exodus 40, 33. And he reared up the court round about the tabernacle and the altar and set up the hanging of the court gate. So Moses finished the work. He didn't stop when they got halfway through. And I'm sure I know the history of that crowd Moses was working with. He had to deal with a lot of bickering, a lot of fussing, a lot of naysayers, a lot of doubters, and those that just didn't want to be in it to start with. But you know what he kept going on, the Bible said, so Moses finished the work. We know Paul finished his work. In 2 Timothy 4, 6, and 7, the Bible said, for I am now ready to be offered in the time of my departure is at hand. I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. Paul finished. I think one of the most determined men in all of the Bible had to have been the Apostle Paul. I don't know of anybody that went through more. I'd not call him the greatest man because that exceeds John the Baptist and he might have been equal with John the Baptist, but Jesus himself said, none born of woman was greater than John the Baptist. But Paul was a great soldier of the cross and he had a determination in him to finish. And when it come time, they were about to lay his head on the chopping block, cut his head off. He'd be a martyr for Christ. He said, I finished my work. I did everything God told me to do. Well, wouldn't that be good to say when you come to the end of your life? That's why I want to be determined to do everything I can for the cause of Christ. I want to do everything. I feel like now, I really feel like now, I've just got to the place where I can see God doing some stuff and and just amazing me at what he's doing in different areas. I just now feel that I've got to that place. I'm not at that place where I can feel confident in myself. I'd never be there. But just now, In my ministry, I began thinking over the last few weeks things that the Lord's allowing us to do, what God is doing, and different things. And don't we'd go into all of them tonight. But I'm thankful I'm seeing more of God's hand at work, I think, than I've ever seen before in the ministry, as long as the Lord's let me serve him in the ministry. And I want to finish that. Jesus finished his task. The Bible said in John 19, 30, when Jesus therefore had received the vinegar, he said, it is finished. Before that, before Jesus was crucified, he said in John 17, 4, I have finished the work which thou gavest me to do. Now, Jesus declared on the cross, it is finished. That's the word telestai, means paid in full. That's what the word finished there. In John 17, 4, when he, the Bible said, uh, he finished the work which thou gavest me to do, speaking of the Father. That means completed. 
It's two different phrases there. But both of them, he's saying, I took care of what I was supposed to take care of. He said, it's finished. There's nothing left for me to do on this earth. Boy, I'd like to be able to say, when it comes time for me to die, I want to have done my best to do all that God would have me to do. I remember that old gospel song, Don't Let Me Leave Behind, an unfinished task. And what a message in that song. And I pray God would help me to where when I die, I wouldn't leave anything unfinished. When I die, I want to do everything that God would have me to do. And then the last point, along with finishing, is have an intent to finish. Make that your intention. Make that a definite in your life. Luke 14, 28. For which of you, intending to build a tower, sitteth not down first and counteth the cost, whether he have sufficient to finish it? We have to have our minds made up to finish. You remember when certain people came to Jesus, they wanted to follow Jesus. Jesus told that rich young ruler, he said, you need to sell everything you got and give it to the poor. Now that wouldn't have made him a disciple. But Jesus knew that was the God of his life. And Jesus said, you're going to have to sell everything. If you're going to be my disciple, you're going to have to sell everything you have and give it to the poor. And it went away sorrowfully, the Bible said, because he had great possessions. He wasn't willing to pay the price. That man that told Jesus, I'll come, but I've got to go bury my father. Jesus said, let the dead bury the dead. His father apparently was a lost man. Jesus said, let the lost bury him. Let the lost bury him. But if you're going to be my disciple, you've got to forsake your mother and father. You can't say, I, I remember years ago when a minister out in Texas had extended a call for me to come there and pastor, and I, it was, had been a great work through the years. And I remember praying about that for six months, and the Lord never gave me any peace about that. And I told them at, at a certain point, I talked to them on the phone, and I said, God's not in that. He's not in that. And I remember my dad telling me, he said, son, I would have never said anything. He said, I'd have hated for you to have moved to Texas. But he said, I would never have said anything because I didn't want to do anything to hinder you or influence you from not doing God's will. If God wanted you there, I'd want you there. But he said, I knew I probably wouldn't see you very often if you was in Texas. But he never did mention that because he knew I had to do what God wanted me to do. And I have every intent by the grace of God. A lot of people, they just don't count the cost. And Jesus said, if you're going to build a tower, you need to sit down, make sure you got what it takes. He said to those who sought to be his disciples, he let them know it's not going to be easy. It's not going to be easy. He said, I don't even have a place to lay my head. You willing to do that? You willing to give up home? You willing to give up security? You know, I want to finish right. I, I want to finish. I, and look, everybody ain't like me and everybody ain't like you. My children always talk about how old-fashioned I am. I've had people tell me I was born 50 years too late. They've told me, I, I saw a picture of my grandmother's brother yesterday, and I probably had seen that picture before, but I looked at uh, my great-uncle and great-aunt, and uh, I thought, boy, I liked how they dressed back then. They dressed modest back then. The ladies dressed modest and the men dressed like men. The ladies dressed, I like that. I determined when Cindy and I got married, I never saw my wife's knees until after we got married. And I remember a preacher telling me, he said, well, you don't really know this girl. He said, what you going to do? And I'm not preaching against you wearing pants, but I had a personal conviction about that. I wanted my wife to wear a dress all the time and I prayed for that. My wife was praying for prayer. She had that same conviction. I didn't know it. But my pastor asked, said, what you going to do if you get down there and she got pants on? I said, she won't. He said, how do you know? I said, because I asked God for a wife that had a certain standard and God told me I was going to marry her and God wouldn't pull a trick on her. I never saw her knees. She is a modest dresser and still is, but I my children said, Daddy, you won't ever change. Well, I said, not on your life. I hope I die before I change. I don't want to change. I asked my wife the other week. I said, Cindy promised me if I die first, 
You won't change your standards. Please don't change your standards. I don't preach against that. You know that. I'm not a legalist by any means. I think you ought to be modest. I like ladies to wear a dress. We ask our ladies in the choir to wear a dress. We ask the men not to wear a dress. And uh, we want them to wear, we want the men to wear pants. They don't even have to wear a tie. But I guess if a lady's going to wear pants up there, a man could wear a skirt. I couldn't say nothing about it. I reckon it would be no different. But uh, I'm going to finish the way I started. I'm not going to change. I, I, I love everybody. You don't have to have. I'm not preaching to you tonight to change for me. You don't have to have the standards I have. I know this, and I see this in church, and this, it, this is concerning. When that standard gets lower of dressing, coming to the house of God, you can't raise it back up. If we come to church, this is God's house. It's God's house. We're not at the ball game. We're not at a ball game. We're here to worship God. And we ought to dress like we come to worship God. And I, I see when the standard keeps going in, next thing you know, you'll see people coming in here with holes in their britches, short shorts. Now, where do you draw the line? And I pray God to help us. Let's, let's, let's raise the bar. Let's not lower the bar. Let's raise the bar. Let's be respectable to the Lord's house. We're coming to honor him. And I look, I, my girls, I tell my girls, they don't dress the way my wife dresses. And that's their business. But I said, your mom set an example in front of you to be a lady. And in every aspect, she's been a lady. Uh, she gets a little pointed with me every once in a while, but I just overlook that and let it go on. But let's finish the race for the Lord the best that we can. Let's don't, let's don't slip into worldliness. Let's don't get to being like the world. Let's honor Christ in our life. Let's let our life be a testimony. And I want to finish the best I can. I want to finish right I don't, if now if, I, if there's something wrong in my life, I want to change it tonight. I want to change it tonight. But what I believe and stand for for the Lord, I don't want to change it. I don't want to change that. And I pray God to help us not change. Let's finish. Let's finish the work and be persistent doing it. Let's win the laws. Let's win people. I was witnessing to a man the other day. He told me he's saved. And I, I don't know how many years this man has been in church, but I was witness to him. He was, he was in a bad shape. It was a week or so, a week or two weeks, sometime in the last week or two. I was witness to this man. His life's a mess. His life's a mess. And I thought, boy, if I was saved in his condition, I wouldn't want to finish like that. I wouldn't want to finish like that. We're not perfect, but we can strive to do our best to finish the race as would be pleasing unto the Lord. I appreciate your attention this evening. We'll take time for prayer requests. Uh, let's remember Brother Duke, of course, uh, Brother Tommy Hilton's